Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new Mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of Sarah Wellgreen. She was a mother of five from the southeast of England and she seemed to just suddenly disappear without a trace one night in 2018. When Sarah went missing a huge search ensued to try and find her and it didn't take too long for the police to identify their top suspect in the case due to their suspicious behaviour following Sarah's disappearance and as they started building up their case against this suspect evidence seemed to suggest that this missing persons inquiry was in fact a murder investigation despite the fact that Sarah's body had not been found. But quickly before we get into the case please listen carefully to the following. Heavy themes such as violence towards women and domestic violence are mentioned in this video. Domestic abuse helplines are linked in the description box and viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case we are going back more than four and a half years now to the autumn of 2018 in New Ash Green, which is a village located in the Seven Oaks district of Kent in England. And this is Sarah Walgreen. She was a 46 year old mother of five who lived in New Ash Green. Sarah was born on the 14th of December 1971 to parents Anne Reed and Anthony Walgreen. And Sarah also had a stepfather, her mother's partner, Jim. I couldn't find any information online about whether Sarah had any siblings or really much about her childhood unfortunately but I do know that she was very very close to her mum Anne. Anne recalls how they would often spend time together, they would go out for food and go shopping and go on holidays and Anne said that Sarah was honestly everything that you could possibly want in a daughter. She described Sarah as being a very kind and caring person but she could also be very feisty. You know she wouldn't be scared to stand her ground on things, stand stand up for what she believed in, stand up for other people. And Anne also said that her daughter was just an incredible mother herself. As I mentioned before, Sarah had five children. She had two sons from a previous marriage. She used to be married to a man named Dave Bedette and she and Dave had two kids together. Their sons were called Lewis and Jack and they were, I believe, both in their early 20s by the time this case took place. Eventually, Sarah and Dave separated and they divorced and it was following this in 2004 when a new man entered Sarah's life, a man named Ben Lacomba. Sarah met Ben through a dating website and they seemed to hit it off and they began a relationship. Ben was introduced to Sarah's sons, Jack and Lewis, who liked Ben. They thought that he was nice. He seemed to make their mum happy and so they were happy for her and I suppose Ben became like a stepfather to them. Now Ben actually lived in Spain because because his parents lived there and he was living there whilst he was in training to become a pilot. That was the career that he wanted to secure one day in the future. Although, just as a side note, that never ended up happening in the end. He never did become a pilot. He did work in an airport at one point, but just not as a pilot. But anyway, Ben was living in Spain and when he started dating Sarah, he actually convinced her to move over to Spain with her sons. He said that they could start their lives together in Spain and settle down and Sarah, excited about the prospect of moving abroad, agreed. She quit her job in England, she worked as a bank manager but she quit her job and she, Lewis and Jack relocated to Spain and they moved into a house with Ben Lacomba. However, this excitement about living abroad was rather short-lived because after moving to Spain, Sarah seemed to struggle for money to provide for her sons. Her partner Ben had previously told her that the salary he would be on as a pilot would be enough to look after her and her boys but as I said a second ago nothing actually came of that he never did become a pilot and Sarah really struggled to find her own job in Spain because she didn't speak Spanish she didn't speak the language so yeah I think they were struggling for money but also as well as that Sarah just wasn't enjoying living there as much as she thought she would because she missed her home she missed England she missed all of her friends and her family 
family and so she decided to move back with her boys Jack and Lewis and also her new baby. By this time she and Ben had had a child together, another son, and so when Sarah went back to the UK in 2006, Ben joined her and eventually they moved into a house in New Ash Green in Kent. Ben started working as a taxi driver when he moved to England and at first Sarah went back to work again in a bank but ultimately she decided that that career wasn't really for her anymore and so instead she started training to become a beautician, a beauty therapist and some years later, I think it was around 2012, Sarah fell pregnant again, this time with twins. So now she and Ben had three children together and Sarah obviously had five overall. However, despite growing their family, the relationship between Ben and Sarah ultimately just started to break down. They started arguing and fighting a lot. I'm not entirely sure exactly what they would argue about, whether there was a particular reason for it or whether it was just a mixture of things. But yeah, they were arguing so frequently that neither of them were happy together anymore. And so in 2014, they decided to separate. Sarah decided to split up with Ben Lacomba, but this was far from an amicable split. Ben had clearly decided that he was not going to make this easy for Sarah because one day all of a sudden without discussing it with Sarah first he just threw her and her two oldest sons Lewis and Jack out of the house. He packed some bags with their belongings, gave it to them and changed the locks. He decided that he was having the house with his and Sarah's three youngest children. He even arranged a family court hearing soon after which from what I can gather he did not tell Sarah about and he told the court that Sarah was essentially a bad mother, that she had decided to move out and leave her kids and abandon them, which of course wasn't true. But because of this lie, he was granted custody of their three kids. However, Sarah was able to get herself a solicitor and about two years after they split in 2016, the custody situation changed because now Sarah was awarded full custody of their kids instead of Ben. Although I think by this time Sarah had reached a point where she was so sick and tired of these court custody battles, tired of fighting with Ben and also she was worried that Ben would just keep trying to regain full custody of the children and obviously she didn't want that, she wanted these custody battles to come to an end and so she came up with a proposal and she put forward the idea to Ben that why don't they just live in the same house together with their kids but in separate rooms. That way they obviously don't have to be together but they can still both live with their kids which is what they both wanted and Ben agreed so they stayed in the same house in New Ash Green. Sarah had her own room and Ben stayed in the attic. They converted the attic into basically just another bedroom. Sarah wasn't totally happy with this living situation as you can imagine. She didn't want to live with a man that she wasn't in love with anymore but I think she just felt that whilst they're three kids were still pretty young. This was the most ideal arrangement, I suppose, and I think she tried as hard as she could to keep things civil between her and Ben. And things did start looking up for Sarah in the love department again, because in 2016, she met another man through a dating app, a man named Neil James. The two, Neil and Sarah, started seeing each other. They both fell in love, and they decided that they wanted to spend the rest of their lives together and so they got engaged. In addition to this, Sarah received even more exciting news regarding her career. After she trained as a beautician, she was able to secure many of her own clients and not long before this case took place, she had actually been offered a job working as a beautician, I believe at a local hotel, this was a permanent position, and she was absolutely over the moon about this job offer. It was in the industry that she loved and also they were offering her a lot more money Money than she was already making, so she was so happy. So yeah, this was an incredibly exciting time in Sarah's life. She had her children, she had a new fiancé, she had a new job. By all intents and purposes, life was almost perfect and she was looking forward to her future. And that is the reason why it came as such a shock to everyone in Sarah's life when all of a sudden, in October of 2018, she just vanished. She suddenly disappeared without a trace. The date was the 
9th of October 2018 and it began just as any other for Sarah Wow Green. That morning she woke up, she got her kids ready for school and she dropped them off at school. By this point, by the way, her three kids that she had with Ben were 12 years old, their first son was 12, and their twins were six. So yeah, she dropped her kids off at school and then she headed to work. She had a couple of appointments with clients that day at their homes and then once she finished work for the day, she drove back home. She arrived home just before 8pm that evening. Soon after getting home, she went off to bed. She stayed on her phone for a little bit, sent a few text messages to her friends and her fiance Neil, and then that was it. It seemed as though she was in for the night. However, the following morning, so this was the morning of the 10th of October, her fiance Neil started to worry about Sarah a little bit because he had been texting her that morning and she never responded. He waited a couple of hours but he never got a reply and so confused Neil decided to get in touch with Sarah's ex and the father of her three children Ben Lacomba because obviously Ben still lived with Sarah. So Neil rang Ben, asked if he knew where Sarah was, was she still at home? However Ben said no she wasn't, he had no clue where she had gone. In fact Ben said that he assumed that Sarah was with him, with Neil and so after getting off the phone with Ben, Neil contacted Sarah's parents to ask if they knew where Sarah was, but they had no clue either. And her mum Anne began trying to text and ring Sarah's phone as well, but she too never got a response. Sarah didn't pick up. And so next, Sarah's oldest sons, Jack and Lewis, were contacted, who by this point in time had both moved out. They were living in their own place. And they were asked if they had heard from their mum Sarah, but they hadn't either. And when they tried to phone their mum, they too had no luck. The two brothers got in touch with their ex-stepdad, Ben Lacomba, and they spoke to him about their mum, although he didn't seem to be too worried, to be honest. He said that he didn't think anything bad had happened. He just thought that eventually Sarah would turn up. And to be fair, I think the rest of the family thought that too initially. Her son Jack said in a documentary that I watched that at first when he was informed that no one had heard from his mum, he just thought that perhaps she was having a bad day. Maybe she was feeling a bit down and so she just went out to get some space or something and that's why she wasn't picking up her phone. But as the hours ticked by and still there was no sign of Sarah, that was when concern for her started to increase more and more. And so the following day on the 11th of October, Sarah was reported as missing to the police. Her ex Ben Lacomba called the police and he told them that the mother of his children had disappeared. Soon after receiving this report, officers with the Kent Police Department went to the address where Sarah lived with her ex Ben and their three children and they took an initial statement from Ben about his account from the night that Sarah went missing and he told the police pretty much what we've already discussed, that Sarah returned home from work at around 8pm that evening. Ben said that he put their kids to bed and then soon after Sarah arrived home, she herself went to bed and he did the same. She went to her bedroom and he went to his room in the attic and went to sleep. And then he said that when he woke up the next morning, Sarah was just gone. She was not in the house. But bizarrely, her car was still parked outside. So wherever she had gone, she hadn't taken her car. It seemed that either she'd left on foot or someone had picked her up. And Ben said that he did find it a little odd that she had left so suddenly. He didn't seem to necessarily think that anything bad had happened to her but he did think that it was strange as it was going to be one of their kids birthdays I believe in the next couple of days so he thought that it was strange that Sarah hadn't come back for that. So the Kent police launched a missing persons inquiry and in an attempt to try and find some clues as to where Sarah might have gone officers had a look around her home specifically around her bedroom and something did immediately catch their attention. They noticed that Sarah hadn't appeared to have taken anything with her wherever she had gone. It didn't look like she had taken any of her clothes with her. As well as leaving her car at the property, she'd also left her car keys and also her house keys. She'd left her handbag and her purse, which had all of her bank cards and her money in. The only thing that seemed to be gone was one of her mobile phones. As I understand it, she had two phones, one for work calls, and one just for, you know, personal 
personal calls and stuff like that and her personal phone was gone it seemed the only thing she had taken with her was her phone and that just seemed really strange to the police and to Sarah's friends and family because if she had left of her own accord surely she would have taken more than that surely she would have taken her purse and her handbag in case she needed money for something so it was because of this factor that the police really had their concerns that something sinister might have happened to Sarah and so they quickly launched a public appeal. They informed the public that Sarah was missing and they urged anyone with any information regarding her whereabouts to come forward and in addition to this Sarah's son Lewis took to social media to try and spread awareness of his mum's disappearance. He put up a post on Facebook informing people that his mum was missing and this post quickly gained a lot of attention. The majority of the people who lived in the village saw it and they just wanted to help Lewis and the rest of Sarah's family as much as they could and so as well as the police being out searching for Sarah a load of volunteers came forward too to help. The local community really came together here. They literally formed a huge search party and they would split people into groups and send them out to different areas in and around New Ash Green to search for Sarah. The police and volunteers were searching along the streets and in fields, wooded areas, parks, just anywhere that they could. But unfortunately, nothing was really found. There was no sign of Sarah anywhere. But as the searches continued, other officers began trying to see if they could trace Sarah's digital footprint. So they looked into her bank accounts to see if she had touched any of her money since her disappearance. She hadn't. And they also tried to trace her missing phone. Although from what I can gather, they were unable to do so because I think the phone had been switched off wherever it was. It just wasn't looking good. As the days went by and there was still no sign of Sarah, it really was looking more and more likely that she may have been the victim of foul play. In the beginning when Sarah went missing, there were theories that perhaps Sarah had just gone away for a while on her own. She left voluntarily. Or there was another theory that perhaps she'd gone out for a walk or run and she'd gotten injured somehow and she was just waiting for someone to find her. But as I said, as time went on, the chances of those theories being a reality just started to decrease and decrease. And the theory that someone must have been responsible for her disappearance, possibly even her murder, seemed more likely. But then if that was the case, who was the perpetrator? Who would have wanted Sarah gone? Who had a motive? Well, as part of their investigation, the police began taking a deeper look into Sarah. Sarah's life into the people in Sarah's life in particular any romantic partners or ex-partners because of course they are always the first people that the police look at when someone goes missing or is murdered so one of the very first people that the police looked at was Neil James Sarah's fiance and they asked him about his movements on the night that Sarah vanished and he said that he was just at home he actually lived in Surrey so he didn't live close to Sarah really Surrey is about an hour's drive away from Kent where she lived and yeah he said that he was just at home that night with his three-year-old daughter but he said that he did speak to Sarah that evening when she got home from work. He said that they spoke on the phone for about a quarter of an hour and then they sent a few texts before Neil went to bed and then obviously as we know the next morning Neil was the one who raised the alarm because he texted Sarah that morning and she never replied and eventually the police were able to rule Neil out as having anything to do with Sarah's disappearance. They were able to confirm that on the night in question he was in fact at his home in Surrey all night. And so the police continued looking into other people in Sarah's circle. They looked at other family members and friends and also Sarah's ex Ben Lacomba, the father of three of her children and the man that she lived with. And actually it didn't take long for suspicion to fall onto Ben because it turns out that in the immediate aftermath of Sarah's disappearance, the police and also Sarah's family had noticed that Ben had been displaying some very 
unusual behaviour, not the kind of behaviour that you would expect to see from a man who is concerned or should be concerned about the whereabouts of his children's missing mother. I mean, that was the exact problem, actually. He didn't seem at all concerned for Sarah, to the point where Sarah's sons, Lewis and Jack, actually had to pressure Ben to call the police and report their mum as missing. He didn't seem to want to call the police, but they kept saying to him, you need to call them, you need to file a missing persons report. And so he eventually did, but only because he was told to repeatedly. In addition to that, another thing that struck Lewis and Jack as being very strange was that just a couple of days after their mum disappeared, the boys asked Ben if they could come and see their three younger siblings, because obviously they were only 12 and 6 years old, so I'm sure that this was a very, very confusing and upsetting time for them because their mum was gone. And so Jack and Lewis wanted to see the kids and I imagine make sure that they were okay. However, Ben said no. He literally banned Jack and Lewis from seeing their siblings after Sarah disappeared, which is just so bizarre. I mean, why would he do that? Well, the brothers had their suspicions that perhaps it was because Ben had something to hide. But the strange behaviour did not end there. Again, in the days after Sarah went missing, instead of going out looking for her like everyone else, Ben Lacomba began planning a children's party. I think for his kid's birthday, which was around this time, as I said, he booked the village hall. He got in touch with this company that did, like, kids' parties games or something. It was just so, so odd. And as well as that, another thing that he did just days after Sarah vanished was he actually went to family court again in an attempt to arrange an urgent hearing to discuss the custody of his three children. He again wanted to be awarded full custody, which is one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard. The mother of his children is missing. She's possibly in danger. And instead, Instead of helping search for her like everyone else, he's organising kids parties and trying to get full custody of his kids. It was honestly like he did not give a single crap that Sarah was missing and everyone was just so baffled and confused by his behaviour. I mean, I get that he wasn't romantically involved with Sarah anymore. They weren't in a relationship, but I'll say it again, she was still the mother of his children. Surely he would want to help find her for his kid's sake, if not for his own. Unless, of course, he actually had something to do with whatever had happened to Sarah. We know that he was in the house with Sarah on the night that she vanished, so perhaps Ben was the one responsible for her disappearance. But in addition to all of this very questionable behaviour from Ben Lacomba, he was also just in general being very uncooperative with the police. Articles state that whenever the police were would go to the house to speak with Ben after he made the missing persons report, it was obvious that he just did not want them there. He didn't want to answer any of their questions. And also, he actually refused to, to give over his mobile phone. The police asked Ben if they could take his phone just for a short while to look at his phone records in an attempt to rule him out as a possible suspect in Sarah's disappearance. But he wouldn't let them. He wouldn't give it over. Well, he said to the police that he wouldn't give them his phone when they first asked for it because apparently he needed to do some things on it, make some calls or something, but he promised that he would bring his phone down to the police station the following day. However, the police eventually discovered that that same evening, after he refused to give over his phone, Ben Lacomba actually drove to another village in Kent called Greenhithe, which is roughly seven to eight miles away from New Ashford. Green. He drove to Greenhithe that evening and whilst there he actually threw his phone into the River Thames and he was caught on a CCTV camera doing this. And then the day following this, he went to a store and he bought the exact same phone. And I believe he then gave this new phone over to the police, acting as if it was his old phone, as if he hadn't just bought a new one. So as you can imagine, when the police found this out, they were even more suspicious of Ben Lacomba. They asked him to give over his phone. He says no and instead gets rid of his phone by chucking it into a river. 
Clearly, this was an attempt to dispose of evidence. There must have been something incriminating on his phone that he did not want the police to see. Maybe he didn't want the police to be able to track where his phone went on the night that Sarah was last seen. And so I believe it was following this when the police decided to just go ahead and arrest Ben Lacomba. He was arrested just five days after Sarah vanished on the 16th of October 2018 on suspicion suspicion of her murder, even though the police hadn't found her body yet. Ben was taken to the police station where detectives began questioning him. However, he refused to answer any questions. In fact, he didn't say a single word. I don't even think he said no comment when the detectives asked him a question. He just said nothing. He stayed completely silent. So not only was he being uncooperative, but he also wasn't even denying it. He wasn't saying, you've got this all wrong, it wasn't me, I'm innocent. He just said nothing, which I personally think is very, very telling. You're here on suspicion of murdering her. We believe she may be dead, and that may be at your hand. So, did you kill her? I'm not clear at the moment, Ben, whether you're just trying to think of an answer, or whether you've decided not to answer the question. Now, despite the fact that the police were pretty damn certain that Ben was the one responsible for Sarah's disappearance, they didn't necessarily feel as though they had strong enough evidence to charge him just yet. The evidence that they had so far was circumstantial and they needed something stronger to press charges. And so shortly after being questioned, he was actually released on bail whilst they tried to build up their case against him. So in an attempt to try and find more evidence against him, the police decided to look through CCTV cameras in the area close to Sarah and Ben's home. Now their house did actually have CCTV cameras installed. Ben had set up quite a few cameras outside of their home and so when Sarah went missing the police asked Ben if they could have the footage. However unfortunately he said that at the time the CCTV cameras on his property weren't operating. In fact he said that they hadn't worked for about a year or so. But thankfully, the police discovered that a neighbour of Ben and Sarah's did have CCTV that was operating at the time. And this neighbour's CCTV camera faced the car park outside of the front of Ben and Sarah's address. So the police went through the neighbour's footage from that evening and just before 8pm, sure enough, they saw Sarah pulling up outside of her home in her car after finishing work for the day. And she was seen on this footage getting out of her car and going into her house. However, what's interesting is that on this night, Ben Lacomba's car wasn't seen in the car park on this CCTV footage, which was odd because in all the days before, the police could see from this footage that he did usually park in the same car park as Sarah in front of the address. But it just so happens that on the night that Sarah went missing, he hadn't. So then where was his car? Well, the police believe that instead of parking it in the car park right outside of his home, Ben actually parked his vehicle in another car park, I think behind the neighbour's house, and there was no CCTV camera covering this second car park. So again, suspicion was just mounting. Every other night, Ben would park his car in the car park just outside of his home. But on this particular night, the night that something happened to Sarah, he chose to park it in an area where he knew he wouldn't be spotted by CCTV cameras. Again, it was clear that he was trying to hide something. But you know what else they discovered on the neighbour's CCTV? They could actually see from the neighbour's camera one of Ben's CCTV cameras on his house. His CCTV camera on his house was in view of the neighbour's CCTV camera. Now if you recall, Ben had told the police that his CCTV cameras had not worked for about a year before Sarah's disappearance. However, 
the police could actually prove that that was not true. He had lied about that because when they took a closer look at the footage from the neighbor's camera from that night, they could see that the CCTV camera outside Ben and Sarah's house was flashing a red light. And that means that the camera was on and it was recording. However, later that night, the red light wasn't flashing anymore. So that indicated to the police that the camera's outside of Ben and Sarah's house were in fact working, but that someone, Ben, turned them off later in the evening that Sarah went missing. But you know what? The CCTV evidence that implicated Ben Lacomba did not stop there because when the police went through CCTV cameras from other areas near Ben and Sarah's home, they discovered possibly their most damning piece of evidence against Ben Lacomba yet. The police collected CCTV footage from other houses in and around the area that obviously had surveillance installed outside of their homes and at around 2 15 a.m on the night that Sarah disappeared they spotted a car a car that looked exactly like Ben Lacomba's driving around in the early hours of the morning. Now, unfortunately, I don't think the police were able to determine the number plate on this vehicle because the footage was a bit grainy and obviously dark, but they could see on the side of the vehicle that there was what looked like a logo of some kind, and Ben Lacomba had a logo on the side of his car because he was a taxi driver. It was his taxi logo, and this vehicle vehicle on the footage was the same make and model as the car that he drove. So the police obviously strongly, strongly believed that this was Ben Lacomba driving around in the middle of the night, which was very interesting because when the police took their initial statement from Ben, he never mentioned that he went out that night. In fact, he told them that he stayed in the house all night and slept but that was just yet another lie that he told. Now, the police tried to trace Ben's vehicle that night through all these different CCTV cameras and also ANPR cameras, automatic number plate recognition cameras. And through this, they were able to determine that he drove out of the village where he and Sarah lived. And the last sighting of his vehicle on a camera was apparently around Plaxdale Green Road in Stansted in Kent. Stansted is a couple of miles away from New Ash Green. Now, unfortunately, after this sighting, the police lost track of the car. They don't know where it went after this sighting on Plaxdale Green Road. However, more than two hours later, at around 4.20 a.m., his car was seen again on the same CCTV cameras, driving in the opposite direction, as if he was now driving back to his address. So he was out of the house for more than two hours in the middle of the night on the night that his ex-partner Sarah Walgreen went missing. As I'm sure you've probably guessed by now, the police strongly suspected that during those two hours, he went and disposed of Sarah's body. He probably buried her somewhere in an area in or near Stansted. And just as a side note, something that the police later found at Ben's address, actually hidden in his garden shed, was a shovel. And the police believe that he may have used the shovel to dig Sarah's grave that night. He claimed that the shovel was a gift for his mother because apparently she liked to tend to the flowers and the plants in his garden, but the police did not believe this. As I said, they believed that the shovel was used to help him bury Sarah. Now, the police were also able to obtain CCTV footage of Ben's vehicle the morning following Sarah's disappearance as he took his children to school, and they could see on this this footage that his car was suddenly very, very muddy. He had a load of dirt and mud on his wheels and also just on the doors and on the sides of the vehicle. But then just hours later, his car was spotted again on another CCTV camera and now it was spotless. There was no more mud on it. It looked good as new. So clearly he had taken it to be clean, taken it to a car wash or something. But you have to ask yourself why the car was suddenly so muddy in the first place. That suggested to the police that during those two hours in the middle of the night, he must have driven to some kind of muddy, wooded area and that that's probably the place where he disposed of Sarah's body. So it was following the discovery of all of this 
this new evidence when Ben Lacomba was re-arrested in December of 2018, more than two months after Sarah vanished. The time is 6.45. You are further under the arrest. Suspicion of murder of Sarah Wilgrain. Well this is a further arrest for the discovery of fresh evidence. Is that it? Okay, yeah, same thing, my heart would like to mention the question in court. As far as I'm aware, following his second arrest, he once again pretty much refused to say anything, refused to cooperate with the police, but regardless, he was still charged. Charged with the murder of Sarah Walgreen. Again, despite the fact that no body had been found, whilst detectives had spent the last few months building their case against Ben, other officers and volunteers still continued the search for Sarah, and they searched everywhere that they could think of everywhere they thought someone might try to hide a body so again they searched fields and woodlands and large bodies of water but tragically they had no luck they couldn't find Sarah but the police still felt that they had enough evidence to show that there was no proof of life no evidence to suggest that Sarah was still alive and they had evidence to prove that Ben Lacomba was the one who took her life and so the case was headed to trial Ben's trial began in September of 2019, so just under a year after this case took place, and as expected, Ben pleaded not guilty to the charge of murder. And during the trial, the prosecution presented to the jury all of the evidence that the police had obtained in the case, and they also talked the jury through their theorised version of events from that night. The prosecution believed that at some point, when Sarah returned home from work on the the evening of the 9th of October 2019 after their three kids were asleep in bed an argument probably broke out between Ben and Sarah and it's been theorized that this argument may have been about Sarah wanting to buy Ben out of their house so as we discussed earlier on in the video despite not being together in a relationship anymore Ben and Sarah had agreed to live with each other for a while in the same house with their three children. However, I don't think this was ever going to be a long-term thing because Sarah didn't want to live with Ben. She didn't want to live with her ex, but for a while I guess she didn't really have much of a choice, or at least that was until she landed her new job. If you recall, not long before she went missing, she secured a new job as a beautician at a local hotel, which meant that she was going to be earning a lot more money, and with this new money that she was going to be earning, she had had decided that she wanted to buy Ben out of the house so that it would just be her name on the mortgage and so that they could finally move on and actually be separated. So it's the prosecution's belief that that night Sarah went home and she told Ben that she wanted to buy him out of the house and that Ben just snapped. He was angry at Sarah for proposing this idea. He didn't want to leave the house. He didn't want to lose control and so he snapped and he killed her. Obviously we don't know how he murdered her because her body has never been found and the only person still alive who can actually tell us the events of that night always refused to talk and confess. So we don't know how he killed Sarah but afterwards it's believed that he put her body in his car which he parked in the car park where he knew there would be no CCTV which just as a side note suggests to me that this crime was premeditated. The fact that he parked his car in the car park farther away from his address just because he knew there were no cameras that strongly indicates to me that he probably he probably planned this to some degree but anyway he put Sarah's body in his car he drove to some remote location in the early hours of the morning and he buried her and then he returned to his home got his car clean the next day and then he carried on with life as normal that was the prosecution's theory on what happened that night and at the end of the trial the jury were sent off to deliberate and when they returned to the courtroom they announced that they had found 40 year old Ben Lacomba 
guilty of the murder of 46 year old Sarah Walgreen and he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 27 years but of course that is not where this case ends in fact this case is far from over because to this day more than four and a half years later Sarah's body has still not been found according to online articles even after Ben Lacomba was convicted and sent off to prison the police did continue the search for her for about two years after her death however they had no success and so in October of 2020 the police search for Sarah Walgreen's remains came to an end but Sarah's friends and family and members of the local community have never given up the search for her to this day there are still people out searching for her burial site the search team set up a page on Facebook called search for Sarah Walgreen which has more than 14 thousand followers and they also set up a GoFundMe page and the donations to the GoFundMe will be going towards funeral costs for when they hopefully do recover Sarah's body and the remainder of the donations will be going towards the future needs of Sarah's three youngest children as they effectively lost both of their parents. However, following the loss of their mum, Sarah's three youngest children did go to live with Sarah's mum and stepfather so they are living and being cared for by their grandparents now. If you would like to make a donation to the GoFundMe page, I will leave a link to it down below in the description box, as well as the Search for Sarah Facebook page. And I just hope to God that one day soon, Sarah's body will finally be recovered. Because until she is, the family won't ever have full closure. They haven't been able to give her a proper funeral or a burial, and they don't have somewhere where they can go to speak with her and be with her you know they don't have a grave or anything which is just devastating the family have pleaded with Ben Lacomba to please just tell them the location of where he disposed of Sarah's remains they've literally begged him to tell them but being the coward that he is he has always refused to do so so yes yeah, Sarah's body has still not been recovered to this day and that is it for this case that is the solved case of Sarah Walgreen as always please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments down below I would love to hear what you guys think also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel thank you all so so much for watching please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!